And so <clears throat> this evening, the discussion is going to be reflections on the Alaka De Palma Sutra. And this is known in English as the Sutra on Knowing a Better Way to Catch a Snake. Uh, and the particular translation I'm using is that which is by Thich Nhat Hanh. It's actually one of the only translations that's available. Uh, his translation, well, I'll, I'll discuss that in a moment. So you can pull up the gallery again, please. So the Alaga de Puma Sutta is the collection of middle length discourses in the Pali Canon, the Srivakayana Canon. And a Sarstavadian critical revision is included in the Chinese canon called Arita Sutra, as evidenced in the Taisho Triptaka number 26. And specifically, as you'll discover, it's referred to as the, the Arita Sutta Sutra because Arita is one of the uh, prominent personages that's in the, that's in the uh, sutra. The Pali or Shravakyana version translates it as the Snake Simile Sutra, while the sutra recorded in China, for, which was done, translated in 398 CE, is called the Aritha Sutra after the main character, who is cautioned by Shakyamuni Buddha. And if you look at your handout, the main feature of the sutra is that there are many interpretations and misinterpretations of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. And sometimes this is done out of ignorance and other times for reasons as the sutra instructs. And I'm just reading from the handout. There are always some people who study only to satisfy their curiosity or win arguments and not for the sake of liberation. By liberation, we mean liberation from samsara, from uh, the mundane life. Um, with such a motiv motivation, they miss the true spirit of the teaching. They may go through much hardship, endure difficulties that are not of much benefit, and eventually exhaust themselves. In other words, if one has a uh, mistaken understanding or mistaken interpretation of the sutra, then quite often the intent of whatever the, the teaching happens to be is going to be of no use. That's really what it comes down to. And the sutra begins with Bhikshu Arita, a former vulture trainer. I have no idea what vulture trainer means, by the way. And I did a little bit of research and I still couldn't find out what a vulture <laughs> trainer does. Um, and he asserts, I believe that the Buddha does not regard sense pleasures as an obstacle to the practice. We repeat that. He had stated numerous times, I believe the Buddha does not regard sense pleasures as an obstacle to the practice. And he's corrected several times by other monks that sense pleasures are, in fact, an obstacle to attaining awakening. Aretha nonetheless held on to this view. Thus, the bhikshus went to Buddha's hut seeking his teaching to settle the matter. Buddha then goes into a more detailed discourse explaining that sense pleasures are an obstacle to the path, admonishing Aretha for presenting a distorted and willful misinterpretation of the teaching. Buddha explains that misrepresenting the teaching, Aretha has done harm to himself and others. And this is a serious transgression. And let me just make a point here that many people are mistaken in the notion that everything that we read in the sutras is only from Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. But in fact, many of the sutras have material that came from some of his disciples. And so the disciples were doing teaching at the same time. It wasn't just Shakyamuni Buddha who was, who was doing the teachings. This was Shakyamuni Buddha himself, the historical character, but also many of his disciples, some of whom are well known and others are less known. Um, Buddha explains, oh, I already mentioned that. Um, he goes on to say that some people are willful in their misinterpretations, while others do not understand the letter or the spirit of the teaching. And he uses the simile of the snake as a way to further explain this. The title comes from this simile and from the handout. 
Dictures, a person who studies that way can be compared to a man trying to catch a poisonous snake in the wild. If he reaches out his hand, the snake may bite his hand, leg, or some other part of his body. Trying to catch a snake that way has no advantage and can only create suffering. Bhikshu's, Bhikshu is, is one of the people who's taken uh, vows, um, an ordained person. Understanding by teaching in the wrong way is the same. If you do not practice the Dharma correctly, you may come to understand it as the opposite of what was intended. The instruction continues with instructions as to how to catch a snake correctly using a fork stick and dragging it behind the head, then can't bite you. This simile is intended to convey that the Dharma does not exclude enjoyment, that which is around us, a beautiful day, a glass of cool water, etc. We should enjoy everything in moderation and recognize the impermanence of all phenomena. In other words, the simile of the snake says that if you are misinterpreting or you have been given the Dharma in the wrong way, it's like being bitten by the snake. On the other hand, there is a correct way to do it. And that doesn't mean that you, in this case, have to avoid all sense pleasures. It's saying that specifically you experience sense, sense pleasures, firstly in moderation, and then you're not attached to them. Those two things are really important in this. Um, he even explains that he's enjoyed many things. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't. We should enjoy everything in moderation, recognize the impermanence of all phenomena. I should restate that because this sutra is also about impermanence, which is one of the three seals of existence, that everything changes, nothing, nothing is static. Um, he even explains he has enjoyed many things, the feeling of joy, happiness, well-being and such. He's abandoned self-mortification. So this isn't a uh, dictum that suggests one should self-mortify oneself. When the Mahanama, the king of Kapilavastu, offered the Sangha a delicious lunch, the Buddha knew that it was a good meal and expressed appreciation for it. And he goes on in some detail of other situations in which Chakramana Buddha has, has involved himself in sense pleasures and the benefit that he received from it or how he perceived it. He states, we all need joy and happiness. We only have to be aware that all things are impermanent and subject to change, including the cool breeze, the setting sun, Vulture Peak, which was one of the main places from which he taught, and Vaishali, which is one of the cities that, that he taught from. And then there's another famous parable in the Short Sutra that we've all heard of, namely that of the woman and the raft. And everybody, I think, has, or many people at least, have heard this. And it is desperate to cross the river. A woman builds a raft and with great difficulty arrives on the other shore, metaphorically representing the difficult journey into the Dharma towards the destination of realization and ultimately enlightenment. Buddha cautioned his students. But after arriving on the other side, she thinks, I spent a lot of time and energy building this raft and it's a prized possession and I'll carry it with me as I continue my journey. If she puts it on her shoulder or head and carries it with her on the land big shoes, you think that would be intelligent. Well, of course, all the big shoes said, no, that's pretty dumb. Um, and we've all heard this parable as a cautionary tale that the Dharma, the teaching, the practices such as meditation are not the end in and of themselves. In other words, we don't practice meditation for the sake of meditation. And that's really important to, to keep in mind. Um, they are the means to awakening. So awakening is the ultimate, if you will, not the meditation itself. And it's not the goal. Only awakening is addressed as the intention or the outcome by Shakyamuni Buddha. Now in the commentary by Thich Nhat Hanh, he writes, and I quote here, Shakyamuni Buddha teaches impermanence no self, emptiness, and nirvana, not as theories, but as skillful means to help us in our practice. If we take these teachings and use them as theories, we will be trapped. In the time of the Buddha, and also today, many people study Buddhism only with a view of satisfying their thirst or their intellect, 
They pride themselves on their understanding of Buddhist systems of thought and use them in debates and discussions as a kind of game or amusement. And it's quite different from a Dharma discussion when we discuss the teachings with co-practitioners in order to shed light on the path of practice, unquote. Now, another major point in this sutra is the instruction of the six bases for views. And these are the body, one, two, feelings, three, perceptions, four, mental formations, five, consciousness, and six, the world. And Shakyamuni Buddha instructs us that we confuse these views as the self, which is mistaken. Of the final view of the world, he teaches, some people think the world is the self. The self is the world. The world is me. I will continue to exist without changing even after I die. I am eternal. I will never disappear. Please meditate. And of course, this is a, a quote from the Sutra. Please meditate so you can see that the world is not mine, is not me, is not the self. Please look deeply so you can see the truth concerning the world. The Buddhist teaching of no self is one of the teachings that is most likely to be misunderstood. The preceding passage provides us a better understanding of how we might apply the notion of self, no self. And I don't think I have to mention that the first five of these things are the skandhas. And they, the idea of the no self is a direct refutation of the Vedic and Upanishadic literature which is the self as Atman, is found everywhere. And Brahman is the permanent and absolute element at the beginning and the end of everything in the universe. In other words, when this was originally being uh, a discourse, Shakyamuni Buddha was using this as another way to argue against what we think of as the Vedic. We think of that today as the Hindu system in which the self is Atman and the self is actually eternal, that it continues on after death and is reborn and reborn and reborn and reborn. Um, and just, just to be clear, from a Buddhist perspective of no self, once we die, because each of us is unique and we are the product of the causes and conditions in which we live, our parents, our teachers, our siblings, and all those people, that once we die, that is gone. That Thing that we think of provisionally as self really doesn't, doesn't persist. Um, what's reborn is are our actions during this lifetime, not the person. And that's where we would argue that the self is one of the things, or non-self, no self, one of the things that is often misinterpreted. When we hear about rebirth, people think, oh, that's great. What's so bad about, about that? It means I get to do it all over again. Well, um, no, you don't get to <laughs> no. do it all over again. <laughs> that's, that's the yes, point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the simple passage is a reference to the five standards or aggregates in which individuals often misperceive as the individual self. In the above, we see that the world is an object of consciousness. And therefore, it is consciousness. An object of consciousness is also called the Dharma, and all Dharmas constitute the world. That's referring to that last section where he was referring to the world. There are a number of other elements that we could discuss in this sutra. Though it is short, the sutra itself is short, it's filled with insight, and there's not enough time this evening to discuss these other elements. But I'd like to part with this sutra with the final words that are in the final stanza, and I'm not going to make a comment on these. Uh, in the final stanza of the sutra, the Buddhist preaches, if at the time of passing from this life, someone has faith in understanding the teaching, he or she will be born in a blessed world and will continue to progress on the path to highest awakening. Having heard the Buddha speak thus, the bhikshus with great joy put the teachings into practice. And could you go on to the next slide and then unmute everyone? And that's the woman crossing the uh, river on the ramp, by the way. We have a good, good uh, record. The photography then was incredible. <laughs> yeah.
So do we have any questions, comments, or thoughts? And we'll unmute everyone. What questions, comments, or thoughts do we have? It's so true. So this, this is from Wushing. Go ahead, Wushing. The sutra is uh, regularly read and practiced. It's it's one that is yeah. It's it's. You, have you heard of the, the oh, yeah. of the raft? Yeah. Well, that's where it comes from. <laughs> and uh, um, so it, we the the version by Thich Nhat Han is probably primarily the Chinese rendition of that. Yeah. What, what other questions do we have? Yes. I have a question. I have oh, a question. Hold, hold on just a moment. First, Shoshin, and then who was that? Seishin. 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 Okay, Seishin. Seishin. Please so go ahead, Shoshin. Question is the last uh, quote that you read there seemed to contradict um, very sharply what you just said about you know, um, being born, reborn. yes, it says you'll be he or she will be born in a blessed world and will continue <clears> to <throat> progress on the path to highest way. Yeah, that is that is implying one you, you can interpret that one of several ways, and you have to remember that this was translated in the fourth century CE. So at that time, the pure land had been present in many of the writings. And so that could be speaking about the pure land. It's not the self that's being reborn into the pure land. Again, it's one's um, karma, one's actions that are being reborn. And, but it's being reborn into the pure land, not into the samsara world. The other aspect is, and the other interpretation that could go along with this is that from a earlier version of the sutra, which was what we think of now as, as the Theravada version of the Pali Canon, that what was the intention of the Theravadan teachings, and that was to extinguish self through one's death at the time of one's death. One was an arhat, that one would extinguish all um, uh, sense of the self However, one's karma would be continually be reborn until one reached that stage of the archon. So it, it could be referring to that. So I'm not sure, based upon Thich Nhat Hanh's, uh, and I looked in the commentary, and it doesn't it doesn't say uh, it doesn't address it doesn't address that issue. Um, but those are two two potential uh, understandings of that. Is that okay? Um, Somebody had a question on Seiji. Oh, Seiji, yes, thank you. Uh, I just had a question about what I'm looking at. I just have my phone. I don't have a, a, my computer. And I think I'm looking at the head of a reptile. Yes. Is that what I'm looking at? That's and was, was that part of a bigger picture? Was that, so I just wondered what the head of the reptile represented here or was telling me. Well, you mean on the you mean on the on the PowerPoint? Well, I, I guess it's a PowerPoint. I just see a head of a reptile. That's okay. All. Okay. Yeah. What? What? Because it's the simile of the snake. Yeah. Oh, so oh, so it represents the snake. Yes. Okay. I get that. Then. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, and you know, very often I have some sort of animal or wildlife, <laughs> and and I thought, well, this is the simile of the snake. So not to have the snake would seem disingenuous at the very least, right? <laughs> Perfectly straightforward, of course. <laughs> okay. Uh, what other questions? Jake, go ahead. Jake, yeah, so is, that, is, is that a dragon? No, that's the white snake. It's from the Chinese legend of the white snake, if anybody's oh, heard of it. Okay. Uh, from, where, from where I am, you're just a little <laughs> tiny box. So I can't see it very well. Go ahead, Jake. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, so how do we... Um, how do we relate this teaching to other teachings or other um, things that we come across in Buddhism? So if we look at 
for instance, the Sutra of Innumerable Meetings, the idea that there are infinite ways to interpret things and that sometimes that can actually be used to help people. And then on the other hand, we also have, all, as you say, rather than just having one Buddhism, we have many different kinds of Buddhisms with different ways of interpreting things and sometimes very contradictory kinds of ideas. How do we, with those two kind of issues, how do we know if the way that we're interpreting something is the correct way to interpret something? Okay, well, I, and that's a great, that's a great question. And I think that we, we have to look at it in several ways, one of which is Shakyamuni Buddha, when he taught, as we know from, from the Tachi Lun and we know from Chigi's writings in general, that he taught different things to different people in different ways that they could best understand them, right? Now, having said that, sometimes what he might have said in, at time A might actually contradict what he might have said at time B, that he himself said that. So what is being discussed here is more not the interpretations that we can understand from what has been given, but how people... Um, purposefully misrepresent the material. That is to say, for instance, in the case of Aretha, the bhikshu that is the, the figure in this sutra, that the bhikshu was intentionally saying, Shakyamuni Buddha said that sense pleasures are no obstacle. Well, he never said that, right? That, that's, that's a little bit different. Now, I look at it today, when I look at Buddhist modernism, I see all kinds of intentional misrepresentations because people don't like whatever was taught. You don't like rebirth and you don't like karma. We'll just take them out. <laughs> well, they're essential to the teaching, right? That's, I, I think that's more to the point. There are many interpret legitimate, authentic interpretations that can be made in this last uh, uh, paragraph. I had mentioned that we can interpret it this way or we can interpret it that way. In the Pali, it might have meant this. Later on in China, it might have meant that. I'm not attempting to interpret it in a way that would be slanderous or that would be against the intention of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. So it's addressing specifically people either through a mis... Uh, there could be an honest misunderstanding, but then... The teaching is that if you don't understand it, you shouldn't be teaching it, <laughs> right? <laughs> or an intentional way of misstating what Shakyamuni Buddha had, stated, had said. Those are two different things. Now, I will quite often say to you, here's my opinion, so that I'm not attributing it to Shakyamuni Buddha. And that way... If I'm saying something, that's what I'm giving is a more um, consensus interpretation of the teaching as opposed to just here's how I feel about it. Those are those are two different ways. Is, is that helpful at all? Very, very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think that's also the very benefit of lineage. Right. I mean, uh, you know, when, that's what Hogo is. It's like, thank you for passing this down in this way. Yeah. Um, and is that, is, is, is what Jake is harping on, is that what is in the simile is like how to approach the snake? If you yes. approach it from the front, you're going to get struck. Well, not or, only. Or, or in this if, particular way. If you, if you just grab it, right, right, sort, right. Of, sort of casually encountering it as opposed to purposefully approaching it, you know what you're doing, you know how to do it. That's a different, that's a different issue. So with the snake, you want a fork stick, put mm -hmm. it behind the head, grab it behind the head, now it won't bite you. If you're gonna do it, do it right. Do it right. Right, exactly. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? No? Ladies? Oh, sure. Uh, there are so many times in my life I thought uh, I had the snake 
<laughs> and uh, it turned around and bit me, and I, and I, from that vantage point, I said, "Oh, now I see the mistake." But how do you ever know? You're never in a point where you have absolute knowledge of everything. You always have incomplete knowledge, so you think you understand things, but then it may be from a different perspective. Right. right? And, 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 and you don't know that you don't know. Right. That, 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 that can be a real problem. I agree. And, and I think that that's when we talk about having faith and having the teacher and having faith in the teacher. That's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, Ichishima Sensei, do you have any comments you'd like to make about, about this uh, particular sutra? Yes, I, I have uh, another interest to the snake. Uh, that uh, you know that mm, Buddhism spread to uh, you know the northern countries and also the southern countries, uh, Theravada and the Mahayana Buddhism. And in the case of Theravada, very con uh, I think uh, concerned with uh, the snake because snake lives in a very what shall I say water side, and the water is very important to. Uh, to uh, ripe the, uh, for instance, rice, etc. So in the case of Cambodia or Thailand, they love that uh, kind of snake because snake uh, provide the water to for us to for the food of the rice, etc. And so and also at in the at the time of Buddha Shakyamuni when he was uh, practicing meditation. And as a body tree, uh, some uh, uh, sometimes a big uh, storm came, and in that case, uh, in the, at that time, big snake appeared from the ground to cover uh, Buddha Shakyamuni uh, for the against the storm. So uh, this tradition is very uh, influential in the, uh, especially southern part of Asia, uh, Cambodia. You know, as you know, when if you go to Cambodia, you see lots of snake, uh, snake. Uh, what shall I say? Uh, sculptures and and uh, because Cambodia is a rice country, so uh, they need water. So the snake provide water. So this is a water kind of tradition as connecting with uh, uh, Jizo Bodhisattva, you know, uh, Kushti Garba, and that also also connecting with the snake sutra. And so that is snake is very important. While I see in the fire side, this is more pure land side, the Amitabha Buddha uh, halo, this is fire. So fire and uh, water is the uh, two traditions of Buddhism, I think. Uh, that is my just uh, comment now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Sensei. I appreciate that. And um, oh, so the ladies who are just came this evening, would you please go with Koshi? So we've got some, for those on Zoom, we have some people who have not been here before. So they're going out to the hondo with coaching so they can get some instruction as to how to, um, what the service is going to be like. Um, uh, I was just, oh, Sensei, uh, I also know that, that your research has led you to looking at the snake in Northern Buddhism um, from Zoroastrianism. That uh -huh. may very well have contributed to it. Now, it's unlikely since this was the Pali canon, it would have been mm -hmm. from more from uh, India, not from the areas where the Zoroastrians were, which is today uh, Iran, the Persian areas. Right. And it wouldn't have had, the, the snake probably did not have the same meaning, but it's interesting how in Mahayana, we have the meaning of the snake in a very, in a different fashion, which is coming from, um, from what would have been Zoroastrianism, you know that that's one of the things that you, that actually you've written about in the past. And again, the fire and the snake are elements that we see in Zoroastrian. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, the last uh, uh, re really symbolizing the sunlight. Sun is precious, and in the Mahayana sutras, like Mahavairochana sutra, indicates such a Vairochana is a, a symbol of the sun or fire, and so this uh, tradition is much uh, interpreted in the Mahayana sutras. Whereas in the Theravada sutras, they emphasize it's more water side, like uh, at the time of Buddha appear, and you see, as I told it before. Uh, Shakamani, uh, the uh, big snake uh, <coughs> protected Buddha against the storm. So this is these two traditions very interesting. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Do we have any uh, any final questions before we we move along? Well, what I'm going to do is get people started moving out to the hondo, and I'll have Tamami take over in here. Uh, and I just want to mention that the if you are interested in this sutra, it's uh, the, the version that has been translated by Thich Nhat Hanh. And let me just tell you that it's probably altogether less than um, the sutra itself is less than 16 pages of this book. The rest of the book is commentary by Thich Nhat Hanh. And it's referred to by Thich Nhat Hanh as thundering silence. And the reason that he called it that is because he maintained that um, he had studied the Diamond Sutra very, very carefully. And he didn't realize until after he had read the, this sutra much later, than he had originally studied the Diamond Sutra, how much of the Diamond Sutra's philosophy actually arises from this particular sutra, which is really interesting since the major themes of this are shunyata, emptiness, as well as impermanence. Uh, and we don't normally think of emptiness as being one of the, or shunyata as being one of the characteristics that are dominant or prominent in uh, the Theravada teachings. And so I, I think that that's a really interesting, interesting notion. And so once again, in, in sort of a summary, the major aspects of this, aside from the notion of not misinterpreting, whether through, not misinterpreting willfully what was said by Shakyamuni Buddha, if you don't understand it, don't teach it. <laughs> that's, that's a really big one. Don't just, uh, you know, blindly go on like that. But also uh, the teachings of impermanence, the teachings of shunyata or emptiness. And further, the, the teaching, which is that I didn't make a big deal out of earlier, which is that the, the raft as a parable of the raft becomes very important. That we're being told early on in this, don't mistake meditation for the goal. Don't mistake the practices or the philosophies for the goal. These are only ways to carry you into one's practice. And, and, I, and I think about that, especially later in uh, Chinese uh, history, when uh, Chan, uh, Chinese Zen, had begun to abandon many of the Buddhist practices for meditation alone. So this notion of treat the meditation as just a method is, was very important relatively early. So thank you everyone. And we'll have to get Tamami in here to take over and we will- Is yeah. that book still in Christy? Uh, you know, I didn't check. I, okay. I don't know, but I would think because um, see who the publishing was. It's Parallax Press. Yes. So I would, I would, I would think that it's probably still available. I, I can't imagine they would take that out of circulation. Yeah. So thank you, and we're and everyone go on a, go on into the hondo. Come on down. Bye. And we will.
switch our places here. Last week, Wenxin gave a bleak picture of the world in which we live. This was intentionally part one of two parts. The second part this week is more of the corrective that was mentioned at, toward the end of the end. To briefly summarize last week, we were surrounded by forces that are pulling our society apart. The proliferation of weapons whose only purpose is to kill and maim other human beings seems to be beyond our ability to stop. These forces are not just in the United States. They seem to be multiplying around the world. I certainly don't have the wisdom as to how we might seize all of this. But Buddhism does provide guidance in this respect. The guidance is not only regarding right conduct, which all religious adhere to, not killing, not stealing, not lying, not lying, etc. There are also measures we can take to change the course of things over which it seems we have little power. The first teaching is impermanence, that is, Nothing remains the same, everything changes. For the last 60 or so years, we've seen the pendulum swing in a direction toward a more liberal democracy, and one in which there has been slow and incremental change in the direction of equity and justice. Now the pendulum is swinging in the other directions toward more authoritarian and unfair society. Will this last like the previous period for 60 years? Or can we, with our quiet determinations, change the course of this pendulum within a short period of time? The answer to that is up to each of us. Buddhism also teaches us to try to understand the person fighting against us, not merely put up our proverbial fist to change their mind. The people who would return our society to Jim Crow society, a society of privilege for the few and tyranny to everyone else, a people who are afraid of impermanence and change. They are very vocal, active, yet minority. These people are to be pitied. We do not capitulate to their demands, but we recognize their fear. We must stand fast on the side of what is right and encourage other people who share our worldview to take part in this ongoing march toward progress in our society. So last week, when Monshin made some suggestions at the end of the Dharma talk, they are not just actions to keep ourselves busy and feel better about ourselves. They are ways we can be vocal, active, and majority. Writing letters to the editors, holding representatives, supporting political candidates that address solutions. Supporting organizations we admire and having constructive conversation with people around us are things we can and we should do. Finally, find the peace within yourself and allow it to be permeate your being in order to change the consciousness in the world around us. Swaha. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, 
may we bring faith where there is despair. May we bring hope. Francis of Assisi. This one uh, we have used before rather recently, but it seems especially appropriate right now. <laughs> 